here today with Marty Mickelson, a licensed clinical professional counselor in private practice in Illinois. Marty, thanks for talking with me today. You bet. I really want to talk about depression in the elderly because, you know, the population that we're dealing with on Abide With Me is typically elderly and disabled people. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of times um, depression is something that caregivers and family members are real concerned about. Can you give us an idea of what some of the causes of this depression are? Sure. Probably the primary concern when you're thinking about depression with senior citizens is a change for a lot of folks in roles. Um, there's a therapist who did a lot of writing about different life tasks. His name was Eric Erickson. And he spoke of certain tasks that people have to accomplish successfully to move on. And it's, you know, it started out with you know, bonding and it goes on to adolescent things where you're, you're developing an identity and those sorts of things. And the, the task for seniors is what they refer to as generativity versus stagnation, which means seniors tend to look, at, look back on their life and evaluate, have I been successful? And particularly when it comes to retirement and those sorts of things, what do I do now? So what we're looking at is, particularly in today's society where you may not have one job until you turn 65 and retire and work at the same company, and women today aren't defined by you stay home and you raise your kids and you take care of your husband, a lot of other things. What's happening now is people's roles are changing, perhaps against their will, perhaps sooner than they expected them to. And what we need to be aware of as caregivers, as seniors, as people that are in their circles are watching for signs of depression that may develop because of those changes in roles. Um, some of the things that you want to look for are particularly there are gender differences that I should point out. In, in American society in particular, women tend to define themselves by relationships. If you meet a friend of yours or let's say you went to a high school reunion, somebody you hadn't seen in 30 years, and they might come up and they say, hi, my name is Andy and I'm a mom or I'm a grandma or I'm a great grandma or my kids are doing this. And men tend to define themselves by what they do, okay? A man at that high school reunion might say, hi, I'm Marty, and here's my business card, or here's what I do, or if they're retired already, here's what I did. And so what happens is when we don't have those same relationships anymore, the kids don't need us because they're grown up and they're on to their own thing, and yeah, maybe we're grandparents, but we've got less of a control and less of a daily responsibility for those relationships, it starts to change like, okay, who am I? Because I'm not a mom anymore that has to get the meals ready, has to keep the master calendar going so everybody makes it to every sports event and everything like that. And with a man, what do I do when I don't tell people, hey, I'm Marty and I'm an engineer, or I'm a counselor, or I'm a teacher? I have to come up with something new to define myself not just to tell people but also for me to know this is who I am and this is what I do. So what are some of those signs that a caregiver or a family member can be alert to? What, what might we notice that's changing? Things that you want to look for in someone who may be experiencing depression or the beginning of depression is changes in habits, changes in attitudes, changes in needs. Changes in habits are they don't necessarily like to do the things that they used to. Okay? Now, the flip side of that is not true. If someone takes an interest in a new hobby or something, you know, they've been working their whole life and all of a sudden they want to start writing or they want to start painting, hey, that's fine. That's great. That's something we would like to happen. But if someone has always enjoyed watching a certain sports team and now they don't care, someone has always enjoyed going to the grandkids' 
piano recitals and now it's they forget about it or it's the least important thing to them maybe they're starting to experience some of these things changes in physical things appetite is worse or noticeably increased sleep habits are one of the things that we really notice I sleep all the time because I don't want to get up and deal with the world or I can't sleep because I'm thinking and obsessing and worrying about things. Another thing that we look for, particularly if the depression is starting to get a little more severe and you're starting to be concerned about perhaps suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. people start to give stuff away. Mm -hmm. And people start to say goodbye instead of see you later. You know, whatever, you, know you, you notice a pattern and it's important for family members and caregivers to be in tune with, um, I can't really think of a good clinical word for it, but it's like the vibe, the hair on the back of your neck that you just, how did he say that again? Something just wasn't quite right. Mm -hmm. You know, you're saying farewell to grandpa and he would always say, hey, see ya, or whatever, and now it's like, well, goodbye, and it has a tinge of sadness to it. Mm -hmm. Th those are extreme cases. What you're really looking for is, to some people, do the people you care about seem to be different? Has something changed? And you don't want to overreact to it because one of the things you know to think about normally in the life cycle as you age, people that you know pass on. You know, your parents are gone, and then maybe your siblings are gone, and then all your contemporaries and then Every reunion you go to, there's less and less people. You know what I mean? Yeah. These are natural things, and it's natural to feel sad about that, and it's natural to wonder, well, when's it going to be my turn? And boy, this, this 60, 70 years wasn't as long as I thought it was going to be. That's all normal. Mm -hmm. Again, you want to be in tune with the intuitive side. If you kind of feel like something's wrong, notice it, observe it, maybe talk about it with the person, mm -hmm. talk about it with other people that are in that person's life that you can count on and say, have you noticed anything else? Don't intellectualize and talk yourself out of it, just be aware. Okay, so, well, let's first of all talk about if, if I myself am starting to notice these feelings of depression, what can I do for myself, first of all? Okay, some self-care things you can do are identify goals and it's, I think it's always a good thing to write goals down what do you want to do and here it is 2012 August what do you want to be doing eh, when the new year comes uh, what do you want to be doing a year from now um, if you are retired already what is it you want to do and how does that compare with maybe what you thought of when you were 40 years old looking towards retirement down the road. Um, you know, write those things down and gauge your level of interest, maybe on a scale of one to 10. You know, And then come back and look at it in a week, in a month. If you're getting feedback from people saying, well, you don't seem to have as much energy or as much excitement about life as you did. Okay, you know, my goal is I wanna to go to Florida and the way I feel about that today is an eight and you go back and you look at something you wrote four months ago and it was an eight. I think you're doing all right. Yeah. Okay? If your interest level is a one and you weren't really aware of it until you sat and thought about it, okay, maybe it is impacting you a little bit. Another thing you want to figure out is if you do define yourself by your job, what are you going to do when that job's not here anymore? Plan A is I'm going to retire and I'm going to do this. Plan B, you can start thinking about what ifs. Hey, I watch the news every night. Economy's up and down, having some trouble. Some companies are closing. What am I going to do if I get called and say, you know what, we're downsizing, and you know you're 58 years old. We know you're going to retire sometime. We got to pay these guys that are younger and are cheaper. We're going to have to lay you off. Yeah. Hey, that's a world-shattering thing. What if that would happen? What am I going to do? And so when you're talking about self-care things, start thinking about what that plan B might be. 
Um, if you have no idea, then who might? Who would you talk to? Who would you trust for counsel to say, well, maybe you ought to try this? Maybe it'll be your kids. Maybe it'll be, you know, a mentor of yours. Same thing for females. Okay? And again, I'm not minimizing that females don't define themselves by career. I'm just saying in traditional roles, what are you going to do when the kids graduate from college and then spread to the winds? Mm -hmm. You know, if you and your spouse want to stay in the area where you raise your kids because you want that to be grandma's house, great. But the kids are in California and Florida and Maine, what are you going to do? When you don't have all these tasks. So you start thinking about those things. Hey, when you're a young parent and you got kids running around the house and it's chaos, you can't wait till they're gone. Yeah. You're thinking, I can't wait for peace and quiet. But what are you going to do when it does happen? Mm -hmm. Start making those plans. And again, if you can't come up with anything and you think, I'm going to lose my mind when that happens, then you might want to talk to somebody else outside. Okay. Okay, so that's me, myself. Yes. Noticing that I may be having a problem. What if I'm noticing that my mom or my dad may be slipping into depression? Yeah. How, how do I reach out to them? I would suggest having a frank conversation with them, asking them, you know, how are they feeling? On a scale of 1 to 10, how, in the last month, how sad have they been? And they may say, you mean on a daily basis or at all? And there's your opening to get into, okay, well, let's say on a daily basis, oh, one. Okay, well, how about at all? Well, nine, I had a really bad day yesterday. Okay, what was that about? Mm -hmm. Maybe a friend of theirs passed away. Maybe, you know, something like that happened. Or maybe they just had a really blue day and it's an opportunity for you to feel that out. Have a conversation about these kind of things. It's like, you know what? I was talking to a friend and he helped me understand that people really need to have a plan B when plan A comes to an end. We all hope plan A is going to end in a controlled, planful manner, but if it doesn't, it's good to have a plan B. What can we do about that? Particularly, what I like to tell people to do is look at the different domains in their life. Most people think there are only two domains, work, home. Okay, let's take a look at home. What, what happens at home? Well, you have family and those relationships. You have a relationship with your significant other. You have financial concerns. You have church. You have friendships. You have hobbies. You have all those things. And this can go back to one of your previous questions about things to look for. Look at all those different domains and are you seeing things change? Mm -hmm. Okay, significantly so, or just anecdotally, well, now that happens. I mean, I don't do the same things now I did when I was 25. Mm -hmm. Okay? If, if you notice a loved one with changes in those domains, the first thing I would suggest is talk to them about it and see if maybe you can help them come up with a plan B. And if they don't... If they don't seem to be able to come up with a plan B, and maybe you're at an end, a loss to do that, maybe that's when you want to reach out for professional help. You know, depression kind of gets a bad rap because some people think that it just means sadness. Mm -hmm. um, other people kind of look at it as, you know, it's a weakness. You know, just buck up, come on. You know, you can deal with this. You know, my parents went through the depression, et cetera, et cetera. Depression has a physical component. It can be chemical in nature, either based upon body chemistry, which changes over the life cycle, mm -hmm. or it can be, you know, external factors physically, you know, substance abuse, you know, a change in diet, you know, toxic things that you're ingesting that maybe you shouldn't eat anymore, those kind of things. Depression certainly has an emotional component, it also has an intellectual component. If you spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, I'm at this age now, and physically I can't do all the things I could do 10 years ago, 
how much more debilitating am I going to be in another 10 years? Mm -hmm. Or your parents are dealing with certain physical health issues or whatever, and now you're caught in between in what we call the sandwich years, where maybe you still have some responsibility for your kids. Yeah, maybe they're out of school, maybe they're out of the house, but you still, you're trying to help them get started out, or you're paying college loans, or there's grandkids you want to help out. And then you and your partner are here, and then your parents are starting to have issues physically, financially, whatever else, and you're feeling that pressure. You're being pulled both ways, okay? I kind of got off the track there a little bit, but I think what you want to do is if you pull all the people in your loved one's life together and you talk about the different domains and, hey, what are you observing and do you have concerns about this and have you noticed the difference? <laughs> And if you come to the conclusion that, yeah, maybe there's some depression we need to be concerned about here, and you have trouble answering the question, what should we do about it, then you might want to get some professional help. And what kind of professional help? I mean, do you go to your medical doctor? Do you look at the yellow pages for a counselor? Yeah. Go to your pastor? What, what's the right thing to do? Well, it's different for everybody. <clears throat> Most people probably would start with their medical doctor because that's who they would have you know, the, the closest relationship with about what's going on with their physical well-being. Certainly, we don't want to ask, underestimate the impact of spirituality on depression. And faith plays an important role for a lot of folks in helping to get through that. I tend to look at, if I'm looking for a counselor, I would much prefer to be referred to one than pick one out of the phone book. Not because I'm knocking anybody, but I'd like to know you know, kind of an Angie's List type thing. You know, what do you know about this person and were they helpful or whatever? A pastor's a good place to check that. Call in your insurance company. You know, they probably have a preferred list of providers and you can say, well, you know, what do you know about these people or whatever? And a lot of counselors may, might even have a website where you can, you know, look up and maybe have some testimonials, that type thing. Um, sometimes it may be um, it may not necessarily be, you know, counseling where you come in and you, you know, sit in the chair or you lay on the couch and you talk to the therapist. It might be that you're going to participate in a group. You know, you might find a counseling center and there may be a seniors group. Or there might be a, a group for seniors or they have all kinds of neat names for midlifers and all this kind of stuff um, at churches. You know, or at senior centers, agencies in town. Those are the kind of places that I would call. And and if I was looking for myself as a senior, or if I was a loved one, I'd, I'd call and find out what's out there, and then talk to your loved one and say, look, here's some different opportunities. Let's call and check this out. Let's go. When you're looking for a counselor, if you decided you did want to sit down and talk to a counselor, do they want a male or a female? Do they want somebody younger? Do they want somebody older? Everybody's tastes vary. Do they want somebody of the same faith? Do they want somebody that defines themselves as a Christian counselor or not? Well, All kinds of different ways. What kind of training ways. should a person look for in, in a counselor? Well, licensed um, therapists is the standard, you know. And just just a brief what we're talking about with that, you know, a therapist would study um, psychology or counseling psychology or clinical psychology and they would get a bachelor's degree and they would get a master's degree and they would have to have a couple thousand hours of supervised experience okay. after their master's degree and then they would have to sit for a licensing exam in their respective state and pass that exam and then they would have to take a national test that sets the bar for what skills you have to have all those certifications are what you would want to find. You know, you wouldn't want, you know, Bob and Joe Smith's Counseling Center that, you know, they have a hand-painted sign out there. Might be great counselors, but the phone book that you mentioned earlier, uh, I don't get a whole lot of referrals from the phone book, but just the fact that it's in there gives credibility mm -hmm. to potential customers so they know who I am. They're going to come in, they're going to want to look around, what are your credentials? A lot of counseling centers, a lot of individual therapists, groups, agencies will have brochures and say, this is our specialty. 
Now, if, if somebody would need medication, that would need a psychiatrist, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, and I, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a really good point because you mentioned people going to their family doctor, and a lot of times what will happen is people have the most confidence in their family physician, and they will talk to her or talk to him and just say, I'm feeling a little depressed, could I get some medication? And a lot of times, GPs will prescribe something short term. The other thing happens, I have clients that I have worked with before who are reluctant to have medication. And what I tell them, because I'm not a proponent of it, and I'm also not resistant to it, it all depends. Medication for depression works wonderfully if it's a chemical depression. Mm -hmm. It really can adjust things and help you out. And the analogy that I heard from someone that made a lot of sense to me that I've used with clients is, okay, pretend for a minute that you've got a really painful sore throat and you go to your doctor. And you may not even go to your your regular doctor, you might go to urgent care because it hurts so much. You know, it's right here. And you go in there and the doctor, you know, checks you out, does a little lab work and says, okay, I got good news and bad news. Okay, what is it? Well, the bad news is you got strep throat. Okay? What's the good news? The good news is we got antibiotics that will treat it. Okay, well, let me have the antibiotic. Well, hang on. The, I got more bad news. The other bad news is it takes five to ten days for the antibiotics to kill the bug. So you got more good news? Yeah, I've got medication that will give you symptom relief. It will relieve the pain while the antibiotic cures the disease. Okay. Okay, I got it. Makes sense. Okay, now let's translate that to counseling. Therapy is going to help you work through this depression. It's going to take some time. Medication is going to give you some symptom relief. If you can't sleep, it will help you rest. If you're sleeping too much, it might perk you up. If you're crying all the time or you can't focus or you're just feeling depressed and hopeless, it's going to elevate you a little bit and level you out so we can work on the issues. That's great. If you are so hopeless and devastated that you can't make it to the appointments, it's going to be hard to work on this. Mm -hmm. So I'm not pushing medication, I've just seen it work very well. And I don't see it as the cure. Mm -hmm. And most, most people in the therapy field believe that the best prognosis for success with depression is a combination of medication and treatment. And so in my practice, I will refer somebody if they decide they want medication to a psychiatrist. And that psychiatrist and I will coordinate. Because a psychiatrist meets them, evaluates them, prescribes a medication, and then sees them for medication monitoring. They don't normally do the counseling. Mm -hmm. It's a different discipline. It's like your GP and your cardiac surgeon. Okay. They have different functions. Does that make sense? It sure does. Yeah. That's great. Well, hey, Mara, you gave us a lot to think about, and I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. You bet. Good luck. Thank you.